In America, Thanksgiving is considered a holiday where families get together. They bond and share what they are thankful for. Sometimes Thanksgiving and or Christmas are the only holidays some families get to travel and see each other. Families enjoy good food, share laughs, and appreciate the quality time spent together, but one thing that is hard to avoid during these times is family drama. Secrets, jealousy, and lies can bring about the worst attitudes, and ones who were excited are now wishing they were back home and away from their family. So much was true for the Andrews family. Sweet and mild-mannered Lowell killed his loving family on what was supposed to be a happy Thanksgiving weekend. William and Opal Andrews lived on a farm in Wolcock, Kansas and had two children together, Jenny Marie and Lowell Lee. Lowell was born on September 21, 1940. To neighbors and extended family members, the Andrews were a loving family and many people had great things to say about Lowell. He was polite, kind, smart, always listened and had great manners. One neighbor was quoted saying that he was the nicest boy in Wolcott. Standing at 6 feet 1 inch and 250 pounds, his size meant nothing and his quiet demeanor allowed him to fade in the background. He did not like much attention and spent most of his time reading, learning science and listening to music. The only worry his parents ever had was how often he spent time alone or how often he spent hours in his room reading. Opal, although worried, chucked it up as her son just being shy because of his weight and size. His family were devout Baptists and his parents were financially successful running their farm. Lowell did well in school and upon graduation, he was accepted to Kansas University in Lawrence, which was just an hour away from his family home. His love for science and music continued on with him in college because he majored in zoology and played the bassoon for the college's orchestra. Lowell had a good first year and was now in his sophomore year at Kansas University. It was nearing Thanksgiving and like most schools, Lowell's school had a break. During Thanksgiving break 1958, Lawrence and Jenny left their colleges to visit and spend time with their parents. Thanksgiving went on without any issues, but a few days after Thanksgiving, Lowell was feeling indifferent. Jenny and Lowell's parents were in the living room watching television, but like typical Lowell, he was secluded in his room reading The Brothers Karamzov. The Brothers Karamzov is the last novel written by author Fyodor Dostoevsky that took two years to write. The book is very deep and it takes a look into questions of God, ethics, and free will. In the book, faith is brought up along with the critical thinking concept of doubt and reason. The main plot of the book revolved around patricide, so the conclusion could be made that this book motivated Lowell to gather up enough strength to do something unfathomable. Lowell finished the whole book the night of November 28, 1958, and immediately went into the bathroom to shave. After cleaning up, he equipped himself with a rifle and a pistol that was stashed away in the upstairs closet and proceeded to walk downstairs to where his family was watching television. After making it downstairs, Lowell fatally shot Jenny first, Opal second, and then William. After killing everyone, he opened a window and then began to ransack the house to make it look like a robbery gone bad. When he was finished staging a fake scene, Lowell grabbed the two guns and headed off to his university. It was snowing and very cold that night, but Lowell ended up making a stop when he made it to a bridge in order to ditch the guns by throwing them in the Kansas River. He continued on with his drive and made it to his dorm at the university. The landlord questioned why he was back, being that all of the students were off campus for the holidays. He communicated with her that he was only there to pick up his typewriter in order to complete a homework assignment. After gathering his typewriter, he left to enjoy a showing of Mardi Gras at the Granada Theater in Lawrence, Kansas. The typically shy and quiet Lowell was a very different person that night. He was very talkative with people at the theater, including an usher and the candy bar attendant. The late showing ended at around 11 o'clock that night, and once over, Lowell drove back to his family home in Wolcott, and the first thing he did was feed his dog. He then called the cops to report a robbery and waited on the front porch with his dog until cops arrived. Police arrived at around 1 o'clock the following morning, and Deputy Myers, who was a responding officer, was quoted saying, This big, dark-haired boy, Lowell Lee, he was sitting on the porch petting his dog. Lieutenant Athey asked the boy what happened and he pointed to the door real casual and said, look in there. After officers discovered the dead bodies, they called for backup and began questioning Lowell. Lowell denied knowing anything and expressed his innocence as well. 
They told him that his clothes would be tested for gun residue, and he responded by saying he shot his gun the previous afternoon in an attempt to kill a hawk that was flying near their home. Responding officers questioned Lowell for about 10 minutes, and although they noted he cried once, overall he seemed very unconcerned or bothered that his family was killed. The assistant county attorney arrived at the scene of the crime, and Lowell was asked what he was going to do about the funeral arrangements to which he replied, I don't care what you do with them. After detectives found out the Andrews family belonged to a Baptist church nearby, they reached out to the pastor of the church, Reverend V.C. Damerin, so that he could speak with Lowell. It was now around 2.30 in the morning, and Lowell was taken into temporary custody. He was driven to a courthouse in Kansas City, but there was no discussion of pressing charges on him because they were not 100% sure he had anything to do with the murders yet. Shortly after his arrival, Reverend Damerin made it and requested to interview Lowell in private. The assistant county attorney was quoted saying, Yes, of course. He is not accused of anything, and we certainly don't know whether he has anything to do with this or not, but talk to him and any information he can tell us relative to this would certainly be helpful. Reverend Damon's request was granted. They spoke about Thanksgiving and the days following it. Reverend Damon said, you didn't do this terrible thing, did you? If you did, now was the time to purge your soul. After hearing this, Lowell admitted to the crimes against his family. After hearing Lowell's confession, Reverend Damon advised Lowell that he did not have to speak with investigators and that he would refer him to good lawyers that could help him. He made a point to let Lowell know that not only was he his minister, but his friend as well, and he would stay with him for as long as he needed to make sure his rights were preserved. With that information, Reverend Damon walked out of the interview room into the waiting room and told the assistant county attorney along with officers that Lowell was ready to give a statement. Lowell was advised by the attorney as well that he did not have to make a statement, but Lowell gave him the same reply that he gave the reverend. The attorney then called for a stenographer who arrived in 20 minutes. While waiting for the stenographer to arrive, Lowell was given a can of Coke and then made a voluntary statement in front of everyone in the waiting room. He was asked how he felt during the murders, and he replied by saying, I didn't feel anything about it. The time came, and I was doing what I had to do. That's all there was to it. His confession of killing three people was transcribed, signed by Lowell, and then taken to the Justice of Peace at around 4 o'clock in the morning. Within the next few days, Lowell led police to the Kansas River where he ditched the guns. Detectives were only able to find pieces of the guns. He was also taken to a clinic in Topeka, Kansas where he spoke with Dr. Joseph Satin. Dr. Satin diagnosed Lowell with schizophrenia but said that he was not delusional, knew right from wrong, and was aware of everything. Lowell also admitted for the first time that the reason he killed his family was to inherit the family farm and to get the $1,800 savings that were in his father's bank account. Dr. Satin called it the sudden murders because Lowell was sane before and after the crimes. He could see that Lowell was clearly emotionally detached from the murders, but deserved to be punished for his crimes. During trial, Lowell pled not guilty by reason of insanity, and his voluntary confession was also presented. When the jury was not present, the reverend was questioned. What were the circumstances under which the defendant confessed to you in the first place, reverend, when you went into the room? I went in there. I advised him I was there not only as his minister, but as his friend, and we first talked about Thanksgiving, his vacation and school, and a few remarks like that. And then I expressed my regrets as to what had happened out there. And I sympathized with him and told him that I knew he was deeply concerned about what had happened and that he was just as anxious as I and others to find who were the guilty parties. And I said, knowing you all of your life, Lee, and your parents, I cannot believe that you had any part in this crime, but there is some question in the minds of the officers as to the fact that maybe you did have something to do with it, and I am sure that you wouldn't object to taking a lie detector test in order to establish your innocence so that the officers can get busy and find the guilty party. And I said, Lee, you didn't do this, did you? And then it was that he said he did. Is that all he said? Well, I asked him why, and he told me the story. Did you feel that he was confessing to you as his minister and because of his relation to you, or because of the discipline of the church? There is no such discipline in the Baptist church that a member confesses to the minister his crime or wrongdoing. He was seemingly purging his soul of what he had done and was talking to me not only as a minister but as a friend, almost a member of the family, in fact. Lee was in complete charge of his faculties. 
he knew what he had done and why. Lowell, on the other hand, made it seem like the Reverend was a police interrogator and pretended to be his friend and a man of God the night he confessed. The court ruled that Reverend Dameron was not in violation of his professional Christian role and was there as a friend and not there to coerce Lowell. Lowell's insanity defense failed and he was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was sent to Kansas death row at Lansing Prison alongside Richard Hickok and Perry Smith. Richard was quoted saying, I really liked Andy. He was a nut. Not a real nut like they keep hollering, but, you know, just goofy. He was always talking about breaking out of here and making his living as a hired gun. He liked to imagine himself roaming around Chicago or Los Angeles with a machine gun and a violin case cooling guys. Said he'd charge a thousand bucks per stiff. Lowell did try to appeal his case and requested a new trial, but his request was denied. While on death row, some sources say that Lowell dropped from 260 plus pounds all the way down to 180 pounds before his scheduled execution. He had a last meal of fried chicken on November 29, 1962, which was the night before his execution. Lowell was able to speak with reporters and was quoted saying, I'm not sorry and I'm glad I did it. I just don't know why I did it. He never showed remorse. But days leading up to his death, people around him continued to relay that he was a nice and sweet young man. Lowell was officially pronounced dead after being hanged at 12.01 a.m. on November 30, 1962. After his death, he was buried next to his family at the Mount Salem Cemetery in Excello, Missouri. William, Opal, and Jenny's names are all labeled on one tombstone, while Lowell has a separate tombstone next to it with son engraved on it. And now for discussion and question time. You are alive now. Think about if one of your family members kills you and your relatives. Would you want to be buried next to them? What about future generations coming to the grave to show respect and they have to be reminded of the murderer each visit? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Ronald Clark O'Brien was born on October 19, 1944, in Houston, Texas. There is not much on his early life, but when he became an adult, he began a career as an optician working at the Texas State Optical in Houston, Texas. Many knew of Ronald to be an honest, caring, and religious man. He felt a calling to the church and became a deacon at the Second Baptist Church. Along with ministering and assisting the priest, Ronald also sang in the church choir and he ran a local bus program. On top of that, he was married to a loving wife by the name of Daneen. The two had a son named Timothy, who was born in 1966, and a daughter named Elizabeth, who was born in 1969. Unfortunately for the O'Brien family, they were experiencing extremely difficult financial problems. Ronald and Daneen were late on numerous loan payments, and they were forced to sell their home in order to relieve some of their financial burdens. Being that Ronald was involved in his community, his friends and associates were concerned about him and his family, but he would reassure everyone that he would receive money by the end of the year in 1974. Ronald's plans were more sinister than he would lead people on to believe. Things were also not as peachy pastor clean as he would lead people on to believe. Even though he was working as an optician, Ronald had a hard time holding down a job and he had been employed by 21 different companies within a 10 year period. He never quit any of these jobs either. He was fired from each one for negligence or fraudulent behavior. He had even worked as an auxiliary police officer. Some employers also fired him because they suspected he was stealing money from them. At his current job, Ronald was making $150 a week and his salary was barely able to cover food and rent. He was also in more than $100,000 in debt. He defaulted on a few loans and his car was on the verge of being repossessed. In August of 1974, Ronald attempted to get a hold of HCN at his place of work, but he was unsuccessful. The following month in September of 1974, he called one of his friends who worked at the Arco Chemical Company 
and the two had a conversation about the different varieties of HCN. Ronald continued talking about it with other associates and fellow co-workers in order to further his knowledge on the chemical compound. Along with learning more about HCN, Ronald was also focused on increasing the life insurance policies on Timothy and Elizabeth. By mid-October 1974, there was $30,000 worth of coverage on Timothy and Elizabeth. Also in October, Ronald and Daneen had an appointment with an insurance agent to buy a life insurance policy on her, but the appointment was canceled because the couple did not have enough money to pay the premiums on the policy. Days before Halloween, Ronald went to a chemical outlet in Houston, Texas called the Curtin Matheson Scientific Company. He was very shocked to see that the company sold HCN in large quantities, but he only needed a small amount, so he asked a sales associate where he would be able to purchase a smaller amount. He was finally able to obtain what he was looking for, so all he needed to do was put his plans into fruition in order to collect life insurance money. On Halloween evening, Thursday, October 31st, 1974, the O'Brien family went to eat dinner at the Bates family home. Jim Bates lived there with his wife and children. After eating, the wives stayed at the Bates house while Ronald, Jim, and their kids went out trick-or-treating in the Pasadena, Texas area. They made it to the Melvin family home and even though the lights were out, they all went to knock on the door anyway. Ronald stayed behind for about 30 seconds, but he then ran up to the children in excitement, holding a few giant pixie sticks candies in the air. He told the kids that rich neighbors were giving out expensive treats. Ronald said he would hold the giant candy until they made it back home. When they finally made it back home, Ronald held on to a couple of pixie sticks for his kids, he gave two to Jim's kids, and he gave the last one to a trick-or-treater who came knocking on their door. His wife, Daneen, was still not home because she went to visit a friend. Finally, when Jim Bates and his children left, Ronald was home alone with his children and he told them that they could each have only one piece of candy before they went to sleep. Elizabeth chose a random candy and Timothy chose a pixie sticks. It was too difficult for Timothy to get the candy out of the tube himself, so he asked his father for help. Ronald took the pixie sticks and rolled the stick in his hand so that the candy powder would loosen up. Ronald successfully loosened the candy powder and gave the pixie sticks back to Timothy. Timothy immediately began eating, but he stopped after complaining that the taste was too bitter. Ronald then went to the kitchen to get Timothy some Kool-Aid so he could wash the bad taste out of his mouth. After drinking the Kool-Aid, Timothy became violently sick and ran to the bathroom where he started vomiting. After throwing up, Timothy began having convulsions, so Ronald called for an ambulance. The ambulance arrived and transported Timothy to the hospital, but he died after an hour of being there. Doctors performed test after test, and they found HCN in fluids aspirated from his stomach and his blood. The quantity of HCN was a fatal dose to kill three adult-sized men. A few days after Timothy was laid to rest, an insurance agent called the police to file a report. The agent claimed that unbeknownst to his wife, Ronald had taken out policies on his two children before Halloween. Detectives started to do some more digging into Ronald's life and found out that he was in debt. Detectives spoke with some of Ronald's co-workers, and they communicated with them that after Halloween, Ronald had been boasting about how he would soon become financially stable. That was odd to detectives, and it was also strange for detectives when they found out that Ronald had been quizzing his chemist co-worker about different chemical compounds. A search warrant to search the O'Brien family home was then granted. In the home, they found an object with traces of plastic and powdered candy on it. Police were also able to find four other unopened pixie sticks. Upon further investigation of the candy, they discovered that in the remaining candy, the top two inches of each pixie sticks was replaced with HCN granules. Detectives then reached out to the different companies where he inquired about HCN. They found out that he joked with one employee from a company by asking how much HCN it would take to kill someone. While being questioned, Ronald claimed that he was innocent and agreed to take a polygraph test. He failed the polygraph and was arrested shortly after on November 5th, 1974 and charged with capital murder, murdering Timothy for financial gain. He was also charged with four counts of attempted murder for attempting to give other people the tainted pixie sticks. While in jail and before trial began, Daneen would visit Ronald at the Harris County Jail every single week and she said that each week, Ronald would cry to her, expressing his innocence. She was quoted saying, He was so convincing. 
Sometimes I thought, what if he is telling the truth? But I knew he was lying. Daneen also claimed that Ronald made an appointment for her with an insurance agent to buy a life insurance policy for herself, but they canceled the appointment because the premiums were too high. She was quoted saying, I think I really was the original intended victim. There were early signs in our marriage that he was a liar. He only admitted to me once that he lied, but never about Tim's death. But I know in my deepest hearts of hearts that he is responsible for his death. When trial began in May of 1975, Ronald showed little to no remorse, and he claimed that he got the Pixie Sticks candy from the Melvin family home. Mr. Melvin testified, and he said that he was at work and never opened the door for the O'Brien or the Bates children. Even though there were nine people who testified on behalf of Ronald, saying that he would not be a danger to society, and he was a good person, a church-going man, kind, and a great family man, there were others who testified against him. Ronald's brother took to the stand as a character witness and let the court know that his brother was a poor manager who had trouble keeping a job. Ronald's wife, Daneen, testified that he bought $10,000 worth of accidental life insurance policies for both of their children. She also let the court know that a few days after Timothy's funeral, Ronald spent another $108 on premiums for two more policies valued at $20,000 each. Then on one day, Ronald began conversing with Daneen about how they were going to spend the money they were to receive after Timothy's death. His intentions were to pay off bills and to take her on a vacation to Florida. Even though she was alarmed, she kept her concerns to herself. When trial was over, the jury deliberated for only 46 minutes and on June 3, 1975, a jury found Ronald guilty of capital murder. The next day, on June 4, 1975, Ronald was sentenced to death by method of the electric chair. Even though Ronald was sentenced to die by the electric chair, by the time it was time for his scheduled execution on March 31, 1984, the method of execution in Texas changed to lethal injection. Daneen filed for divorce from Ronald in 1980 and refused to talk to the media until it was nearing Ronald's execution day. Daneen was quoted saying, I don't hate Ronald, I just feel nothing. My concern during these years have not been for myself, they have been with my daughter. She has done remarkably well until the last few days. During the interview, Daneen was questioned about how her daughter felt about Ronald's upcoming execution. She responded by saying that six months prior to the date of the interview, Elizabeth wanted to reach out to Ronald on death row, but she has not allowed her to have any contact with him. She has no ties to him. I think she has struggled through that, but she accepts the fact that he intended to kill her too. We refer to him in this house as Ronald, and he is her biological father, only and nothing more. During the interview, Daneen also reminisced about a time before Timothy's death, when Ronald was quoting a Bible story about Abraham. He pondered about how Abraham must have felt about losing and sacrificing his only son. Daneen said it wasn't until after trial that she started to put all of the pieces together. I just started putting all of those things together. He was my husband and I wanted to believe him, but knowing him and living with him almost 10 years, I knew it was possible. Before Ronald's March 31st lethal injection execution, he had a last meal of a T-bone steak, a salad with lettuce, tomatoes, eggs, and French dressing, iced tea, fries, saltine crackers, Boston cream pie, peas, corn, and rolls. In Ronald's final interview, he mentioned that he was a reinvigorated Christian and was quoted saying, because I have no guilt, I've really got nothing to worry about. For his final written statement, he said, what is about to transpire in a few moments is wrong. However, we as human beings do make mistakes and errors. This execution is one of those wrongs, yet doesn't mean our whole system of justice is wrong. Therefore, I would forgive all who have taken part in any way in my death. Also, to anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years, I pray and ask your forgiveness, just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. And I pray and ask God's forgiveness for all of us respectively as human beings. To my loved ones, I extend my undying love. To those close to me, know in your hearts I love you, one and all. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. Ronald C. O'Brien P.S. During my time here, I have been treated well by all TDC personnel. Ronald was pronounced dead at 12.48 a.m. 
and was buried at the Forest Park East Cemetery in Webster, Texas. Also, what do you guys think about him not mentioning his son in his final written statement? Hello everyone, today's video is a story about the Morales brothers and how their deaths led to the death sentence for both Kathy Sarinana and her wicked husband, Raul Sarinana. A question I would like for you guys to ponder on while listening to the story. Do you think Raul and Kathy are equally responsible for the murders of Ricky and Conrad? It all started when Ricky and Conrad were born. They were born two years apart. Conrad was born in 1992 and Ricky was born in 1994. Unfortunately for the brothers, they were born into a family that statistically would make one assume that their upbringing and overall life would be bad and or they would turn out to be bad. Their father was absent from their lives and their mother, Rosa Morales, was a drug addict who sold drugs in order to support her habit. Ricky and Conrad knew nothing but drug users and drug dealers. They were also subject to being physically assaulted and neglected. They were no strangers to Child Protective Services being involved in their lives, but doing nothing to protect them, and they also witnessed SWAT teams bust into homes they were staying in with their mother. CPS removed Ricky and Conrad out of Rosa's care multiple times, but despite her bad habits, they always returned to her until she was finally sent to prison on drug charges. It was late 2004, early 2005, and Conrad was sent to live with his mother's brother, or his uncle, Raul Sarinana. Raul was a convicted felon, and he was married to a woman named Kathy Sarinana. The two were living in Randall, Washington when they accepted Conrad into their home. Conrad's younger brother, Ricky, was sent to live with Rosa's mother or his grandmother. Ricky was very vocal in not liking his new living situation. He told educators, my life is not worth living. He was also caught writing die Ricky die on his arm with a pen. CPS was called because his behavior was alarming. CPS acted and admitted Ricky into a psychiatric facility for treatment and social worker Elia Godinez presided over Ricky's case. Eventually, Rosa was released from prison, but she was not stable enough to have any of her sons in her custody yet. Social worker Elia was quoted telling Rosa, Conrad seems to be doing fine in Washington, so why don't you send Ricky to Washington too? It wasn't a suggestion though, because Elia followed by saying, You've got one week to send him to Washington, or I'm going back to court, and your kids are going back into foster care. Hard to think that a convicted criminal would be a better guardian than grandma, but within a week, Ricky was sent to Washington to live with his brother, his uncle Raul, his aunt Kathy, and their two children. Many thought that life was picture perfect for Ricky and Conrad, especially with Raul providing his family with updates that the brothers were thriving. He described them using extremely positive words. They were excelling in school, getting great grades, making so many friends, and even joined sports teams. Little did his family know, Raul was creating this false narrative to cover what was truly going on behind closed doors. Raul and Kathy were secretly, physically, and sexually assaulting Ricky and Conrad. After months of Ricky and Conrad living in a horrific home, more information was coming to light about their situation. Ricky and Conrad's sister, Destiny Morales, and Raul and Kathy's neighbors reported to authorities on different occasions that Ricky and Conrad were being assaulted. It also came to light that there was no way both boys could have been excelling in school because Ricky had not even been enrolled in school yet. Conrad was attending school, but he was far from excelling. He told his classmates that his uncle Raul had been hurting him, and he also started coming to school wearing makeup to cover injuries he had sustained on his body. After more reports alerting authorities about Ricky and Conrad, Police finally notified CPS and a new investigation in Washington began. At the conclusion of CPS's investigation, they concluded that all allegations from every source were unfounded. Conrad and Ricky's words and marks on their bodies were not enough for CPS to act. Ricky and Conrad were scared and retracted statements they made to classmates or other people when questioned by CPS. They were instructed by Kathy to tell authorities and CPS that they had gotten into fights. After months of trying to get herself on the right track, Rosa was now prepared to bring Ricky and Conrad back to California to live with her. Unfortunately, Raul said that he was not able to afford airplane tickets and that they needed to stay with him a bit longer. A few months later, in October of 2005, Rosa continued to press Raul about airfare tickets, but this time, 
Raul and Kathy let Rosa know that Conrad had run away from home, and for a while he had been acting out at home and school. They tried to reassure Rosa that they were doing everything they could to find Conrad, but it would be tough because they knew Conrad had run away with a gay lover who was much older and elusive. Mind you, Raul had been telling Rosa that he did not have enough money for airfare tickets to send Conrad and Ricky back to California, but Raul was now communicating to Rosa and his family that Kathy was so distraught about the disappearance of Conrad that he was going to fly Kathy and his two young children he had with Kathy to California to live with Rosa. Conrad, of course, was missing too much school, so CPS was contacted again, and there was a new investigation opened up. Little did Rosa and her family know, Raul and Kathy told social services that Conrad was not missing at all and moved with a different relative in another state. Social services believed the evil couple and closed their investigation. Raul tried to play off that he was a knight in shining armor. He said he would not leave Washington until he found Conrad. It seemed like Raul never kept his word because he and his family moved to Corona, California, but did not tell anyone of his new address. It was now Christmas Eve 2005. Ricky and Conrad's Aunt Bertha wanted to visit the family in Washington, and she was given an address from Raul. Maybe Raul did not think Bertha would really make the effort to visit, but she did. When she arrived at the address, she found out that it was a fake address, so she was stuck not being able to see Ricky or Conrad. When Christmas finally came around, Ricky called his Aunt Bertha and begged for her to take him. The family then started to make plans to bring Ricky home. Unfortunately, Aunt Bertha would be the last family member outside of Raul and Kathy to speak to Ricky ever again. By Christmas evening, Ricky lay dying in a closet after being physically assaulted. He was too weak to scream out for help and was suffering. It all started when Kathy had made some food and Ricky said that he did not feel like eating. He was not feeling well because he had just been physically assaulted and was in too much pain to eat. Kathy was extremely offended that Ricky refused to eat food she felt she slaved in the kitchen for, so Raul demanded that Ricky clean one of the bathrooms in the house. Ricky was assaulted multiple times for not cleaning fast enough, and after the third hit, coming from the tip of a hard shoe connecting to Ricky's chest, he started to throw up. Raul was angered even more and assaulted him again before dragging him into the closet. Ricky tried to escape the feces-filled closet, but was assaulted even more and was too weak to attempt trying to leave again. The closet was a frequent punishment location where Ricky would have to stay inside for hours, and because of this, he would pee and or poo on himself, and Raul and Kathy made no attempts to clean the closet out. While Ricky was dying, Raul and Kathy had no care in the world and invited friends and some of Kathy's family over for a Christmas dinner. They had fun talking, eating, and enjoyed cheerful laughs with each other. None of the guests knew that they were feasting with killers. Hours later, when all of the guests had left, Kathy went to go check on Ricky, but found him dead. She supposedly got scared and called 911, and he was pronounced dead late in the evening on December 25, 2005. The very next day, on December 26, Kathy and Raul were both brought in for questioning by the Corona police. Raul admitted to assaulting Ricky, but never meant to intentionally hurt him. Kathy and Ricky were both arrested. Detectives started to do some digging, and they found out that Ricky had a brother named Conrad who was missing. Investigators went back to search Ricky and Kathy's home to see what they could find. When looking in the carport of their home, they found a trash can that was wrapped with plastic and duct tape, and then encased in concrete. It looked very suspicious, and after they were able to get inside of the trash can, they found a deceased Conrad, who in fact had never been missing. Raul told detectives that Conrad died on August 22nd after he had been disciplined and he made up the story of him running away with an older gay lover to hide the murder. Sick and twisted couple Kathy and Raul killed Conrad in Washington and traveled with his dead body on a car ride all the way to Southern California. They had been contemplating when to kill Ricky for months because he witnessed the murder of Conrad. After autopsies were conducted on Ricky and Conrad, it showed bruises and scarring from being hit with cords and burned with cigarettes. They sustained internal injuries, so the assaults were never a one-time thing. We can also all speculate as to why the autopsy report mentioned a scrotal sac being severely damaged. I could not continue reading about the injuries, but it is available if any of you could stomach what Ricky and Conrad had to endure. More witnesses came forward to speak with investigators about Raul and Kathy. 
Some witnesses said that Kathy treated Ricky like her personal slave and forced him to clean up after everyone in the house, including her two younger biological children. Her two younger children, according to witnesses, looked like they were in good health, well-fed, and happy, but they could not say the same for Ricky and Conrad. During trial, Kathy tried claiming that she suffered from the battered wife syndrome and had no knowledge at all about Ricky and Conrad being assaulted. Also during trial, Raul admitted that he assaulted Ricky and Conrad, but swore that their deaths were accidental. The jury did not buy their stories, and with all of the evidence stacked against them, they were convicted of first-degree murder, and the jury recommended the death penalty. During trial, the court was made aware that Ricky and Conrad's older sister, Vanessa, tried to file for custody of them, but CPS and the courts did not give her a chance, despite her not having a criminal record like Raul. She was employed and had been attending technical school. She was quoted saying that Ricky and Kathy deserve the death penalty. I still think they are getting off easy with the death penalty, the way my brothers were assaulted for so long. But to me, they aren't even family. I don't feel bad for them. Raul's lawyer, Victor Marshall, said that Raul had no job, was emotionally unbalanced, and suffered from extreme stress, which caused him to lash out. He also claimed that Raul had a childlike mentality. During trial, they also read Conrad's personal journal. This journal expressed his issues with wetting the bed, questioning his sexuality, and how any time Kathy was having a bad day, she would take it out on family members. The journal gave prosecutors the chance to paint Kathy as the mastermind and the puppeteer who ordered Raul around. Ricky and Kathy were both sentenced to death. Kathy was sentenced on June 26, 2009, and Ricky was sentenced on July 2, 2009. To date, they have not been executed, and they are still sitting on California's death row at different prisons. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Do you guys think Kathy is just as guilty as Raul? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below.